Hi everybody! If you've watched the other videos, you should have all the pieces put together by now. And in this one, we're going to show you how to actually tune your car. Now, this demonstration is going to be on my Triumph TR6 because it's handy and it needed to be tuned. Uh, but technically, anything that has the Zenith Stromberg carburetors, uh, most British sports cars, in fact, are going to be very, very similar. Uh, if you wait till the tail end, uh, the Zenith Strombergs on the later cars use a special tool down the top. Uh, I'm going to show you just a brief clip on a Triumph Spitfire with SUs. Uh, it'll at least give you an idea of what some of the differences are, but the process is pretty much the same uh, with maybe just a different step or two. So uh, anyway, uh, let's get to it. I'll show you how, what tools you're going to need and then I'm going to take you through a, a tune-up step-by-step. So to do a tune-up properly, you really need to have a dwell meter. You really do need a timing light. Uh, you need a flow meter, but only if you've got multiple carburetors. If you've got well, just one, you can skip that. And then assuming that you have uh, Zenith Stromberg carburetors that adjust through the top, you are going to need a special kind of Allen key tool. Uh, a quick note on the timing light. Yes, technically you can time a car using a, a vacuum gauge and uh, it will work. There are so many other things that you need the timing light for. They're only about 20 or 30 bucks. Seriously, just buy one. Uh, and to tune it correctly and make sure the advance is working, unless you also happen to have a distributor machine, you really need the timing light, or there's really just not going to be a way to see if that mechanism is working properly. So just get one. If you don't have these tools, probably not the right video for you. Uh, you can maybe do without the dwell meter if you've got a set of feeler gauges. But anyway, this gives you an idea, uh, kind of prerequisites for going forward. And again, as I've mentioned in my other videos, you really need to make sure that everything on this side of the engine is in good shape. Uh, check out the video on how to redo a distributor. Uh, you need to make sure that you've got good fuel pressure. Your coil needs to be correct for the car. Then turn the ignition on. Remember, the points have to be closed for this to work. And see how much voltage you're getting at that coil. wait to get a consistent number actually. About 8 volts. Had this been battery voltage, which by the way is a little over 12, you would have a 12 volt system. Because it's an uh, about 7 to 8 volts, this is a ballasted system. You must have a 6 volt coil in this car. Otherwise, uh, it's not going to work properly. Now we did look under the hood and see what type of coil you needed, whether it was a 6 or 12 volt. But the problem is a lot of coils don't actually tell you on the coil what kind it is. And so uh, that's where your voltmeter comes in handy. You see I've got it set to measure ohms. Whatever the lowest setting is is fine. Uh, you're not going to have that much in ohms anyway. But what you want to do is just red to positive, black to negative, and touch it to the two different terminals. And you're going to get a number. There we go. Once it settles down, if it's about three or a little bit above three, you have a 12 volt coil. If it's about one and a half, maybe up close to two, then you have a six volt coil. So just make sure that the coil that you have in the car is matched to whether or not that car has a ballast ignition system in it. And by the way, if you're not sure if your coil works, go ahead and do that same resistance check. If you get infinite resistance, then that coil is burned out because there should be some current going through it. So uh, if that's not the case, at least your primary winding is not, well, it's not a complete circuit. So it's not going through the coil. It's junk needs to be thrown out. Did find a, a Mini Cooper that was not working and that's exactly what we found. I checked the resistance on the coil completely shot. It, was, it stayed at infinite the entire time. So uh, it's something to be aware of. The first thing that you want to check is to make sure that your points are working properly. If you do not have a dwell meter, I'll forgive you that one. Uh, they're really not expensive. They're easy to find. You can, any auto parts store is going to have it. But at least check the points gap with a feeler gauge. If you have an electronic ignition, you can skip this step as long as that electronic ignition is functioning anyway. Uh, but what you want to do is set up your dwell meter. Uh, you're going to have one terminal that goes to the same place that the distributor connects to the coil and just clip it on and then the other one's just going to go to any good ground may as well use the battery ground strap i'm going to take this off the engine set it off to the side as 
start the engine. do that, you'll want a screwdriver. Loosen the screw holding the points down. And then adjust it ever so slightly to either open or close it. until your feeler gauge just barely fits between the points without moving anything. Once you're happy with the setting, tighten it back down. And then it wouldn't be fun if it didn't move on you, so always double check it.
that's about even and that's much closer to the RPM range that we want. What you might have noticed is that I went to the front car and then I also pushed down back here with a screwdriver. Sometimes the throttles don't close all the way, so you want to make sure that you don't have a binding linkage. Uh, you need it to be set up correctly. So make sure that your throttles are closed, then take your reading. Once they're even, you're done with the airflow meter. So you can go back to looking at your tachometer, which is about 1300 RPM. So it's still a little bit too fast. We're just going to slow down both one eighth of a turn at a time. Much closer to where we'd like it. Double check your meter. Once we're happy with that, now we can move on to the mixture adjustment. That's where this tool comes in. And what you want to do is lift the piston very slightly, like a 30 second of an inch, which should be fine. Listen to the sound that the engine makes, or watch your tack. What you want to have happen is that the engine speed maybe changes ever so slightly, or, but you want it to stay the same. If it speeds up, that means letting more air in is helping. So if you're letting more air in and that's helping, it's burning too rich. If it slows down, that means that it's you're, you're letting in more air, so it's too lean, because that means even more air, obviously, it's going to make matters work. So lift it very slightly, use a thin screwdriver or your tool. If you do have to make changes, put the tool down the top, seat this middle bit. This keeps you from turning the diaphragm and ripping the rubber. Hold that. Left for lean, right for rich. This carburetor is running a little bit rich. We're going to lean it out. Do an eighth of a turn at a time, and then double check your mixture. You can keep the engine running while you're doing this. It's just a little bit easier to hear me if it's not. Once you're satisfied, recheck the mixture. Double check with your airflow meter. The key difference when you're dealing with SU carburetors, I'm not going to take the air cleaner off, but this is a setup from a, a Mark I Spitfire. And the key difference is with these is that they adjust from the bottom, not from the top. Older uh, Zenith Stromberg carburetors are going to be the same as these SUs. And there is going to be a nut at the bottom. And you'll adjust the mixture, not by moving the needle up and down, but by moving the jet up and down. So. That screw, you know, it's probably easier to just do with my hand. This nut will raise and lower the jet. I'm going to put it back to where it was. When you're adjusting this, go one flat at a time. 
Uh, same thing, you want to disconnect the linkage between the two carburetors. Uh, you want to lift the piston ever so slightly. Some of the carburetors even have uh, a little button on the bottom of the dash pot and you can press up on that to lift the, the air piston just enough. Uh, that's cool if it has it, if it not, just put a small screwdriver in the front like we did with the TR6. But adjust these one flat at a time, otherwise it's exactly the same as it was before. And then, and then the only other thing of note is you see right down here, this is where the throttle uh, connected to the gas pedal, this is where the throttle connects to uh, the throttle plates in the in the SU carbs. And so what happens is when you press on the gas pedal it moves it. Okay, now you'll notice there's a little bit of a gap in there and the difference with these and possibly with older Strombergs but I don't remember, but the difference between these and the uh, the Zenith Strombergs that we just did is you have to adjust this gap. Now how do you do that? Well I can't show you because it's not attached to the engine but with the air cleaners off what you want to do is rev the engine right just go up a couple thousand RPMs and you want to look at the two air pistons and make sure they're rising at the same time. If they're not, if one is rising faster than the other then your throttles aren't synchronized and you have to kind of play around with the linkage just loosen it a little bit adjust it, retighten it, and then try it again until you get both air pistons to rise at the same height, at the same RPM, and that way you know everything's synchronized. Check your mixture again, check your airflow again when you're done doing that, and you're good to go with these. So there you go guys, I hope that helped. Uh, let me know in the comments below if you have any questions. I'll do my best to answer, but I am not an expert on this stuff, I'm just sharing my experience is all. Uh, really is a big help. If you subscribe to the channel, you'll see future videos as I post them. And once again, I hope this was helpful. I would test drive the car right now, but it's almost 11.30 p.m. and raining. So there's really no good reason to take it outside, um, except to test the headlights, I guess, and the wipers. But I'll do it tomorrow morning. So, uh, But again, thanks for watching. I hope this helped.